Today, we are in the second sermon of the Love Where You Live series, and it's out of the book of Nehemiah. We're going through the book of Nehemiah, eight sermons. Second sermon. And now we have Nehemiah. You remember that he's a cupbearer for the king. Cupbearers would drink the wine to make sure that before the king had it, there was no poison and he wasn't going to die. So they're willing to take a bullet for the king. But they were much more than that, cupbearers. They had to be highly educated. They had to be charismatic. They had to be able to discuss politics and other matters of the day intelligently with the king. It was really kind of a friend and a cohort that was, that, uh, uh, that was with him next to the king beside him walking along the way. So this is a very influential guy, Nehemiah. And um, he comes to a place where he's prayed. Now, I want you to remember this. He's, he heard about Jerusalem, and it's been burned down. The walls are knocked down. They need repair. He's been praying for three months, weeping before the Lord. And now we come to chapter two, where he's at a place where he's going to give a bold ask to the king for help. And he's giving that bold ask because he needs provision to get him on the way to building, but it's dangerous. It's dangerous because if the king is not pleased with you, like, like Nehemiah was sad in his presence, you're not supposed to be sad in front of the king. You're supposed to always make the atmosphere great for the king. I'm talking about the culture and what they required of the people in that room with the king. Couldn't make them unhappy in any way, or you'd be in trouble. And if you did something that displeased him, you might not only be fired, you could be killed in this day. So Nehemiah is a little bit fearful, but he's about to give a bold ask. You ever give a bold ask? I remember when I was <clears throat> a little guy, seven years old, we were traveling in a 1967 Ford Fairlane. Our family was across the U.S. And we, we would travel six or eight hours a day several times in our lives. And we had four kids that were six, seven, eight, nine. And we all sat in the back seat of that fair lane. And when we got to sleeping, we had to all sleep one way, sleep right. And then if we, we got a little bit uncomfortable, we'd tap each other. We got to sleep left now. And then we'd sleep left to get more comfortable. But on those long trips, we always thought it would be fun if we could stop and get a pop, a Coke, or a candy bar. And so we'd start uh, scheming in the back seat. How are we going to make this happen? And... Um, at first, little seven-year-old, I was the third in the, in, of the children and in age, and they said, you ask him. So I just asked, and often he would do it. And here's what I thought. My dad's a good guy. I think he really likes me. He might get me some candy. I'm going to ask him, right? That's how it worked for me. But, <clears throat> but after a couple times, um, they said, you ask him. I go, I asked him twice already. You ask him. They go, no, he always do, does what you say. And I go, no, he doesn't. I promise you, he doesn't. It's your turn. They go, you're good at it. I go, what? How do you be good at asking for candy? You just say, Dad, can I have some candy? But I came to find out that I had a little bit more faith that my dad would do it than they did. And so, uh, and I, I thought this, well, I got a better chance if I ask than not, right? So I would just ask, and he was pretty good. Now, I want to talk to you about a bold ask that Nehemiah gave, and a bold ask that you might have to make with your vision and the vision God's given you someday. It's bigger than just candy because that's just, you know, for the moment. It's something that's a vision that God has given and he need, you need provision for it. So you're going to ask him to provide for that vision that he's given. It's a big deal here in Nehemiah. So let's look in the Bible. Uh, I see that the monitor's off here. I hope we have it here for you. But but I would, let's talk about three things, how to get ready for the ask. And the first thing is this, be willing to give up the good things in life for the best. Be willing to give up the good things in life for the best. So here's the cupbearer. He's got everything. He's coming before the king. He's got a nice life. He's really got money. He's got a great place to live. And God's put a burden on his heart to go to a city that's, that's being burned down. It's been burnt down, I should say, and, and, um, and sacrifice. Here's what would have to happen. He would have to give up his time, his riches, and, and, and his place in the palace to go live in the ruins of Jerusalem, and he would have to endure hardship and criticism. So he, he was willing to give up the good thing that he had in his life, all this, all this comfortability for the best thing, and that was to follow God's plan for his life. So let's look at Nehemiah 1.11, 
Oh Lord, it says, this is, this is Nehemiah praying. Let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today. Why did he need success? Well, he was going to ask the king to give the money needed to rebuild the city and the workers. Give me success today and grant me mercy in the sight of this man. Now, I was the cupbearer to the king. So, let's talk about that. We live in a world where everything is about, number one, ourselves. That's what America teaches us. We really worry about just you and your four and no more. That's, that's, that's the way we're wired in America. But that's not the way the Bible is at all. The Bible wants us to be concerned about the things that God's concerned about. To carry the vision that Christ had to reach the lost and disciple those who need, who, who have found Jesus. I, I'm not great at social media, but I, you know, I can figure it out uh, and I'm, I'm on there. But every now and then I see these little like letter things that make no sense to me, like YOLO, you know, and go-go and fofo and fufo. I don't know. They, none of them make sense to me, any of them, right? But, but, but I found out what, what YOLO is. You only live once. Now, that is the very thing that I'm talking about here. When that is, when that is written on, on uh, TikTok or Instagram, what it means is I only live once, so I'm going to take care of me. That's what it means, YOLO. You only live once, so take care of yourself. Make it about yourself. And I'm just here to tell you that's not God's way. If that was God's way, Jesus never would have come. He made it about us. And Jesus said, what these things I have done, you can do and greater. And he's called us to make disciples and to carry his heart. The world says, do what makes you feel happy at any cost. But <clears throat> God tells us that he wants us to serve and be concerned what he's, with what he's concerned about. First Peter 4.10 says this, just as each one of you, has received a special gift and a talent and ability that's been graciously given by God, employ it in serving one another. Okay, let me stop there for a moment. We're in the middle of that scripture there. Uh, this, this is the Amplified Bible, the Amplified Version, which I think says it so beautiful here. But every one of you has an amazing gift or two or three that's been given to you by God. I want you to turn to the person beside you and say, God made you good. Just say that, God made you good, okay? Some of you don't seem too sure about that when you say it to your buddy there, but, but he did. He made you good. He made you wonderful, the Bible says. And he says he's given you gifts. So let me, let me pick it up there again. Employ those gifts in serving one another. What are you supposed to do with your gifts? We feel like the main thing is, well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, do really well in business. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to excel in uh, sports. I'm going to excel in in the things that I love and enjoy in this world, but some of it can have such a worldly flavor to it that God never shows up in any of it. But he says, serve one another with those gifts, be good stewards of God's multifaceted grace, faithfully using the diverse and varied gifts and abilities granted to Christians or to you by God's unmerited favor. So you're supposed to use your gifts to do the thing that God would have you to do to build this kingdom. Now, I, I've talked about vision before, but let me just say, I don't, I don't believe this thing with vision that we're speaking of today works if it's just your vision. I mean, you can have a vision that you're working towards that God has absolutely nothing to do with, that he's not that concerned with, you know, because it's not helping people, it's not moving anyone closer to Jesus, it's not ministering to anyone. And what I want you to know, that his vision will always include helping others come closer to him. His vision for your gifts, if it's really the, a big vision he's given you, will always include helping others. Now, your business can do that, by the way. You can be all in on business and say, I want to glorify God every day. You get up and you say, Lord, help me to bless these workers that work for me. Help me to encourage them today. Help me to do a good job. And Lord, if you have a place for me to speak or witness, just open that door and you can walk and God can use you in an incredible way. So we're all in the ministry, but we can do these things in life with not even, without even thinking of God. Now, as we talk about vision today, I want you to know this. Nehemiah's got a vision. I'm going to talk to you about our vision here. By the way, what's Horizon's vision? 
What is the vision of Horizon? Two things. We want to reach out to the lost so that they might be found. We call that the one. You'll hear that terminology here, the one. The one who needs Jesus. Who's the one in your life that, that you could walk with right now, just be a friend to, and along the way, help lead them to Jesus. The one is, that's part of our vision, reaching the lost so that they might know Jesus Christ. The second thing is discipling these people. To make disciples. So not only winning them, but to make disciples. That they would know the word of God. That they would follow the word of God. That they'd be faithful to fellowship with the family of God. And so we, we want to reach the lost. We want to make disciples. Everything we do comes back to those two things. So when we talk about children's ministry, that's what we're talking about. Reaching, reaching the lost. That these little ones might know Jesus. Because they don't know him yet. But we're, we're nurturing them in the love of God. Did you know that 80% of kids get saved between the ages of 6 and 13. 80% of people get, make their first commitment to the Lord in that age group. Do you know how crucial that is to, to minister effectively in that, in that age group and, and to have outreach as well as they, when they bring their friends? Because people are so open. But look at Jesus and how he served. Well, I, let me go back to vision. I, 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 I can't get off that. Um, we have this vision that God's given us, but we believe that you might have a vision too. I'm going to talk to you about church quite a bit today and ministering in, in this realm right here. But man, I love talking to dreamers. And I believe that God has put some things in your heart. Some of you are even young. Some things in your heart that you want to do, but they sound so crazy to people that you're afraid to even say it. And I'll tell you, God will pull forward someone like a young David at, as a teenager, like, like Mary as a teenager the, the, who became the mother of, of our Savior, he'll, he'll work with even young people to say, if your heart is fully dedicated to me, I'm going to find ways to use you amazingly. But I've always believed that it's not only this dream that God's given us, but it's a dream that he's, that's rising in the hearts of some people that are here too. And, it's, and there are dreams that will go beyond this place to do ministry way beyond horizon, but what, here's what we want to do. We want to bless the dreamer when it's God's vision. We want to help you get there. I was in Washington, D.C. On, uh, on Wednesday, and uh, I was at a missions event where we're talking about reaching um, the Baha'i and Buddhist nations of the world. Uh, when you look at Japan and China, and India, and other nations in that region, you'll find that less than 1% are Christian. And there are very few churches per capita and very few missionaries in that area. Part of the thing we want to do, we're working with the Assemblies of God. It's a huge missions organization. That's where we really spend most of our time hanging out, trying to find the right people to support because we know it's a good place and they're trained well. And they do well. They have a good history. But they want to raise $15 million and send 150 missionaries. Let me tell you what I thought. Um, I'm talking to some young people today. Didn't do this in the first service, by the way. We prayed, and I, I, I want to help send missionaries uh, with money. I, it's very important. They, they need support to go. How can they go unless someone sends them, the Bible says. But I, I believe God's going to call some young people out of this church to be missionaries into that region. I know that's radical, but pastor, uh, the Lord put three, the number three on my heart, that we would send out three missionaries from here to that region. You say, how do we do it? You walk with us, we'll show you how to do it. We, we can get you licensed, we can get you set up, we can get you moving to get support, and it may take years, but you gotta get ready before you're ready anyway. But I'm telling you, if you will dream a dream that's beyond this place, we'll help you with it. You need to write a book that's God's book. We might even help you with that. You, you need to build a ministry for camps. Did you know Teen Reach, one of the ministries uh, that, that followed Royal Family Kids Camp? Royal Family Kids Camp took the orphans up to the age of 12 with an amazing camp. We did that for years. But Teen Reach started out of this church. Teen Reach said, well, we can't just stop at 12 with the orphan. Let's go to 18. And now there's over 100 camps worldwide from Teen Reach because of someone who got a vision in this church. And we support them. They're not even here anymore. We support them. We love that ministry. What I'm telling you is God may give you something. And if he does, we're in. 
You say, well, how do you know you're in? This is what Denny Davis, my mentor, said to me some, a long time ago. If somebody's trying to do something for Jesus, help them. I like it. It's simple. So if you're trying to do something for Jesus and it's really his vision, we're going to be in on that, all right? But look at this servant, Jesus Christ, Matthew 20, 28. This is a way different sermon than the first service, all right? 20, 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Now, wait a minute. This is Jesus. The Son of Man is Jesus here. Hmm. Why did he come? Not to be served. You can't be more royal than this guy. This is God. And he stooped down to come down here, to walk on this earth, to use the restroom. I don't think they do that in heaven. I don't know. Maybe. To get calluses. I don't know. He just... To, to work hard, to be ridiculed, to be crucified, to die for our sins. He came to serve us that we might be saved. And he is our example. He sacrificed for us. So we're here on this earth with a short lifespan saying, God, whatever it takes. Like, I'm just not, I'm just not really about life enhancement with God. I believe he enhances your life in every way. Uh, but I believe the riches are the least of the blessings that God would give you. And too many people put an emphasis on them too much. It's the very least of blessings that he would give you. I believe that our call is to be obedient, to live a life that sacrifices for the sake of others as our example Jesus has done. Man, that's a hard call, isn't it? The, the, the crazy thing is it's the most fulfilling thing in the world. It's what you were created to do. Where's that fulfillment? Where's it at? I don't know. I can't find it. I'm, I'm happy. I'm going to do something for somebody else. Get in with what God's doing as he leads you. And, and he came not to... Not, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ran, ransom for many. Ken Hoff is a friend of mine that's a, that's a missionary in Cambodia. How many have been to Cambodia here? Okay, we've had sent youth tri trips to Cambodia. I don't know. We've probably done 10 or 15 trips to Cambodia uh, for missions. And the reason we do it is once you get in that setting, you're never the same. You see how poor people are. You think you have it terrible. You're a teenager. You come back thinking, I got it okay. It's all right here in America. It's hot over there. There's no air conditioner. And, and uh, it's just, they have a rough place to live, but you reach out, you care about them, and the Lord drops something in your heart. Something about somebody else and not just yourself. I think a root of discouragement could be thinking about ourselves too much. Huh, I could get in trouble with that. I'll, I'll, I'll just tread lightly there. But um, when you, it, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. I'm not even talking about money. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your talent and your time, your gifts and your time. Today is what we're talking about. But Ken Hoff, when he was a youth pastor, gave 50% of his salary to missions. And um, he led teams of missionaries. I was a district youth director who was on our youth senate. He, he was over ambassadors and missions. We take 50 to 150 kids to foreign lands and do outreach. And the reason we did it is because their hearts and lives were changed when, when they went. By the way, if you have a teenager, get them on one of these trips, man, because it'll be one of the greatest things that have ever happened in their life and they'll never be the same. They'll come back changed with their eyes on the world like, like Christ's eyes are on the world. Well, Ken, Ken Huff not only gave but, and served, and, but when he, went into the, to, to, when he went on to become a missionary, I said to him, Ken, you're never going to have any trouble getting support. You know how I know that? Because you gave 50% of your salary all those years. I saw that guy drive a Honda Civic for 320,000 miles. That patina thing, you know, where the paint disappears and the metal starts to show... I walk up to his car and I go, Ken, how many miles is that? 300,000. I think I got another 100 in it. I go, why don't you get another one? Well, then I couldn't give as much to missions. I'm like, well, I think God would be okay if you got a car. And he goes, ah, if he makes this one run, I'm just going to go with it. That's the way this guy was. He has been supported for 30 years or more, never having to look back because he was a giver who gave. Given it shall be given unto you. And God has used him to raise up 200 churches in Cambodia. He's one of the catalysts to see that happen. And by the way, you've built 12 of those churches from Horizon. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, let's thank the Lord for that. <clears throat> but God's tasks aren't always about a foreign country. I need your help today. Um, 
Let me tell you about the mission we're on. We, we grew 5% this last year. It's not as good as I'd like. But here's what we know is happening and we can feel. We, we've gathered some momentum. Coming out of the pandemic, we were knocked back. And um, we, we've slowly been digging out and God has blessed our finances where we've been good. We've been good stewards of everything. But let me tell you, this, this last year, we're not through it till the end of December, right? But we've had 486 people come to Christ in this church this year. Let's give the Lord glory for that, can't we? We've had 76 that are water baptized. And by the way, water baptism on the 22nd. You should follow in obedience to be baptized in water just as Jesus was an example for us. I'll get in that tank with you on the 22nd if you'll, if you'll get water baptized. You've, you've come to the Lord, but you haven't been water baptized. Maybe you're a prodigal and you've come home. Get baptized again. We'll, we'll baptize you. But the 22nd, just sign up, man. That's one of the great things. It's a public declaration that it's down with my old life and up with the new life in Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow Jesus my whole life. You're making that public declaration. Join us. The reason I say that is when you have 486 saved and 76 water baptized, you got to get those numbers to match a little better, right? So let's get, let's get some water baptisms going here. But let me tell you uh, this. Um, Two in three, since the pandemic, two in three, that's 66% of churchgoers say that they have not volunteered for ministry in the previous year. Ministry or non, even volunteered in a non-ministry in the last year. You know what that is? Let me tell you what happened with us. We, we had hundreds of volunteers before we went into the pandemic on several campuses. And then when we were in it for 10 months, well, you don't need a greeter when there's no one coming into the building, right? And you don't need children's ministry when it's not happening that way. It's happening online. We can't meet. So slowly the, those workers dissipated and they fell away and people became comfortable with not being involved. Well, here's what I want you to know. We need you. We, we, we have some needs in our children's ministry right now. I just want to be honest with you. First of all, this is honest. This is embarrassing to me. It's embarrassing because we're not where we should be with the, with the workers. We need to take care of the people's children that are coming. And I'm just telling you today because we have a deficiency and we need you. We need you to take care, help us take care of your kids and your friends' kids here. But this is a world where they're coming. New families are coming. And they're, they're dropping their kids off in a place that they need to see it's safe and that it's covered well. And by the way, we do criminal history checks. We, we make sure we're, we're so cautious here that anybody who ever wanted to cause a problem would choose another place, right? With everything you got to go through with us. But we need loving people to care for these children. We need, we need help in the nursery with the babies. We need help with the toddlers. We need help in the preschool children's church. And and I'm just telling you that we're building a wall, and I, I'm hoping, hopeful that you can find your place on the wall. We'll talk about it next week. They all started to work. They all got on the wall, and they started to work, and they rebuilt Jerusalem. And we need you to help us in this. Not only that, but we need, we need greeters. Greeters are those that are at the front doors, loving people, smiles as they come in. If you have a gift of being a hostess or a host, that you just have that natural personality that loves to see people and, and has that inviting uh, persona. We, we need you to, to exercise your gift for the sake of people who are finding Jesus. Several years ago, a guy came through the doors here as an atheist only because he promised someone he would come if they would do something for him. They asked, he asked them to do something. They said, if you go to church with me, I'll do it. He said, okay. Well, it was his brother and his brother had asked for years, but he, he was an atheist. And so he came in, but didn't want to have anything to do with it, just fulfilling his responsibility. He said, from the time he walked in that door, and people were so nice to him to the time he got in the lobby and someone got coffee in his hands. And then two or three people were asking questions about him. Not, not even ushers or greeters. He said, by the time he hit his seat, he had this thought, maybe I'll have to rethink this thing about Christianity. That's how, that's how he got in his seat. And eventually he came to Christ. You think it's not a big deal to be loved when you walk through those doors? We need you. I need you. We're, we're doing this together. We're building something for God. And if, if you'll take this card, I know I'm making a pull today, but man, it just slots right in with the sermon, right? Here's where we are. Connection card, it says, I'm interested in serving. If you just put your name and number there, we'll get to you. 
but there's a QR code on an envelope in front of you. If you'll just take a picture of that with your camera, hit the QR code, it'll take you right to a place where you can sign up for serving and someone will contact you. Listen, formerly Esperanza, we need you, man. We, we need you right now. We're one. We need you to step in and, and, and fill in the gaps and we can be better together than we were when, when we were in different locations. And so would you get on board with me? Would you get on board to serve coffee, to care? We'll talk about this more next week. But let me tell you a story that I just love about a fellow named Joe Weber from the People's Church. Pastor Denny Davis, this was over 30 years ago, went to Joe and said, Joe, you're such a good man of God. You're such a good example. We want to present you as an elder to the church. And Joe said, oh, uh, wow, that's flattering, Pastor, but I, I'm sorry I can't do that. My ministry's too important. Pastor Davis is thinking, what could be more important than being an elder in the church? You know, it's a place of authority. You have oversight and, 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 you know, great influence. He didn't say that. He said, well, what is your ministry, Joe? And Joe says, well, Pastor, I work with the, the, the toddlers up to four years old. And some of those little boys who come to church, they don't have a daddy. And so I, I'm, I'm able to just affirm them and be kind to them and I'm the only man in their lives that cares about them sometimes and I can pray for them and I can know their names and I'm sorry pastor I can't be an elder my ministry to those kids is too important don't you want that guy watching your kids come on man don't don't you want that person there and listen we we need that kind of commitment that kind of heart so sign up today and help us. Here's a thought for you. Write it down. Don't ask God to bless what you're doing. Do what he's blessing. Don't ask God to bless what you're doing. Do what he's blessing. This church is rising up and God is doing some great things. Second thought right now. We need you. First thing. Second thought. Remember that where God guides, God provides. We see this with Nehemiah. In the month of Nisan, in the 12th year of King Artaxerxes, I practiced that one. When wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. This is Nehemiah. He's the cupbearer. He's making sure the king is safe. He had drank it, and now he's given it to him to make sure there's no poison. Now, I had been sad in his presence. Now, listen, you can't be sad in the presence of the king or you'll get dismissed. You got to make the atmosphere totally happy. That was part of the culture of the day. You, you didn't come in and pout in front of the king. He needed a good environment because he had plenty of problems he had to deal with already. So that's a bit of a problem. And the king said to me, why is your face sad? Seeing you are not sick, this is nothing but sadness of the heart, the king said. And then Nehemiah says, I was very much afraid because he's sad in the presence of the king, right? That's a problem. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And the king said to me, what are you requesting? Or another version says, what is it that you need? Oh man, that's a great thing to hear from the king, right? Because the king has all the resources at hand. He can give him the time to go. He can give him the workers. He can give him the money. And he was about to do all of that for Nehemiah. Nehemiah was afraid because he might say no and he might kick him out of his presence. But Nehemiah had won his favor. And the king said, okay, I like you. Uh, if that's what you want to do, I'm going to help you. So the king said to him, what are you requesting? And Nehemiah said, so I prayed to, to God, to the God of heaven. I think this is interesting that he prays spur of the moment. Eight times in this book, Nehemiah prays in the spur of the moment. Something happens and in that moment he prays. Can I tell you that's something we do here as part of our DNA? Like we're sitting at the table in a staff meeting and we're having a little bit of trouble figuring it out and we just say, let's stop. Let's stop and pray, because we're not on it. Maybe God would just give us a thought. We, we, before I go into an appointment with someone, every time I pray, Lord, help me bless this person. Lord, give me wisdom and discernment. And, and, and in moments when someone comes to me with a tough question, they're trying to tighten the screws or whatever, I just say, Lord, give me the right answer. Give me wisdom. Give me composure in these moments. I'm praying continually as well. Uh, James 4, 2 says, you do, you do not have because you do not ask. And so he's, he's asking, and then in that moment, he's bringing it uh, to the king. His vision was big, and it was going to require a bold ask, and he prays in the moment, okay, here it is, Lord, help me. I like what John Corson, a preacher, says. He says, it's not the length of the prayer that counts, 
but the strength that matters. You can pray quickly and yet very effectively if your heart is in tune with God. And, and, and that in tune with God's a big deal, right? So praying in the spur of the moment, like I'll tell you something I did in school that the Lord did not honor. I was in college one time and I did not study for a test and I sat in front of that test and I said, oh God, help me. God, I don't know anything. Just bring it to my head and my mind and help me put it down. He didn't honor it, you know why? Because I hadn't done the work and he wasn't gonna help me with that. But when you're in tune with God, it's, it's, it's almost like this studying thing where you're, you're ready. You, you've been in relationship with him. You're in the word almost every day. You're praying. You're in, you're in tune and you're following. He's, this guy's following the vision. He's, he's, he's sacrificing as he goes forward and he starts to pray. But he prayed in the moment he was in tune with God and God was going to help him. He prayed for success, but not for personal success. He requested success for God's work. And when God gives us the vision, we don't have to hesitate to ask for success. You know, I've asked a few people in my day to give a million dollars. And some of them didn't. But I'm going to tell you, when the first one did, it made it easier for the ones right after that. You know, it's like, hey, sometimes God does. And people want to give even when they can't. We have such a big vision that we need big people to help us. And I know everybody matters to God, but not everybody has the money to help us build buildings. Everything matters. Can I tell you something about donors that, that give at a high level? They're just like senior associates. They're partners in ministry. We can't get it done without them. And God, God uses them to know how to raise resources. And some of you young people, this may be your call. Like Hobby Lobby in the Greens. That guy's given hundreds of millions a year to ministry. He had four brothers that were in the ministry and his dad didn't like it that he didn't go in the ministry. But he told his dad and his mom, I'm sorry, I feel called to business. And then he goes into business where he's a tremendous witness and gives hundreds of millions a year away for God's work. Just, just do what God's called you to and move towards it. But, but God will bring provision when we're, when we're doing what he wants us to do. Don't listen to the voices that say God's vision is too big for God's provision. When I hear that, all I can hear is God can't do it. That's what I hear. Well, that's a lot of money. I don't know. Good luck with that. All I hear is, you, I don't think you can do it. Well, here's what I want to say to them. You're right. I can't do it. But I serve a God who can do it. I serve a God who put it on my heart. It wasn't even my idea. And I'm moving for him. And I'm going to tell you something. He's provided before. We slain the bear. We slain the lion. This giant is going down. If God says he wants to do it and we get in and we follow and we're faithful, he does something amazing. And he was about to do it for Nehemiah right here. Where God guides, God provides. My son was six years old. God had spoken to me and said, I want to build a great high school to glorify my name. By the way, I wasn't in on the high school when God told me that. I was like, hey, how about we do something else, you know? Are you sure? Because all my friends say that's not a good idea who are pastors because it just drains you like crazy as leaders. I'm just telling you the truth. But God said, no, I want to do this. Doesn't it make sense that he would put it on my heart. Can't we see now why he would want this with what we've come into in America right now? With what's being taught at our schools, let's be honest. Can't we see why he might want one to raise up? And he was talking about it years ago, so it'd be ready for the day. I'm telling you, every Christian school in Oregon had a waiting list of 100 to 300 people in this last couple of years because of what's happening in our schools, because of what's been projected upon our children. I love the public school. I love Christian leaders in the public school. I want to support them. They're Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're Daniel in the lion's den. We're here for you. But we also want to protect our children as we go forward. And this is, a, this is an arc of safety. Well, anyway, so I finally got in on the vision and said, okay, Lord, it's obviously what you want to do. I'm in. But, but I said, Lord, would you do something? Would you show us a miracle if you want this to happen? I just threw a fleece out. I said, do something in the next couple of weeks. Within a week, I was kneeling at my six-year-old son's bedside, which I did every night. And I said, hey, buddy, uh, we feel like God's called us. I had talked to the elders to, uh, to, to build a high school. Um, but we need help. And we're, we're just going to need millions of dollars. And we need more land. And we need more buildings. And, you know, it's just almost impossible. And I said to my six-year-old boy, would you pray? Pray with your kids, by the way. Take them on the journey with the vision. And I didn't pray. I said, would you pray that God would help us 
get the resources to, to get this done. So Aaron, simple prayer, Jesus, we really need your help. Could you send some money so we could get the land and build the buildings? I'm not kidding you. We, he was done with that prayer, and Karen came down the hallway and said, there's someone on the phone for you. So he got on the phone, and there was a fellow on the other and said, hey, if I gave you $600,000, what would you do with it? And I was like, something really good. We'll do something really good without, you know, we'll figure it out. <clears throat> and um, I said, well, I've got some thoughts, because I was already thinking about the high school. And that's what he wanted. I didn't even know that. We didn't talk about that on the phone. But I said, let me talk to the elders and see what we would do. Within a week, <clears throat> that became a million dollars. But I ran right back to Aaron's bed. He had just prayed for resources to come. And I said, hey, buddy, you're pretty good at this prayer thing. I just want you to know. Because I just talked to this guy who gave $600,000. Keep praying. <laughs> well, that person would eventually give $2 million through over three years, and the church would match it with $2.5 million. By the way, I just want to tell you, I sold my best car. I took my retirement accounts, and I put it down for this property in this building, and so did other people in this church. There's been a great sacrifice that's gone forward for this. But you know what? We're here to, to do God's work, to, to build God's kingdom, and this is the call that, that he has Given you say, you shouldn't talk about that and what you've done. Well, First Chronicles 29, go read it. Talked about the leaders giving lead gifts and how the people are encouraged and followed. It's right there in the Bible. And so, so it's, it's like, like, you know what? If I don't give in missions, this church isn't going there. If I don't lead the way by sacrificially giving in missions, nobody else is going to do it in this church. If I don't lead the way in these other things, so leadership requires that you're in. Nehemiah's in. You know how he's in as a leader? He's given up everything. He's given up the palace. He's going to a place where he's going to be criticized. He's going to have to fight battles and win them for God to build this wall. But he'd been faithful and he had prayed and now God was giving him the provision. Luke 16, 10 says, whoever can be trusted with little can also be trusted with much. So I just want to speak to something that I think this culture has a problem with. <clears throat> and, you know, I, I, at some level, it's, it's a younger generation, but it's, it's older generation too. By the way, if you think that I've got a blind spot, you can come speak to me about that, and, and I want to grow too. But I think this is a blind spot in America right now. People don't understand that faithfulness leads to leaders trusting you. It's like we're doing this socialism thing where everybody's the same, and, and it doesn't matter what you do if you're fruitful or loyal or faithful. It's nonsense. Faithfulness leads to leaders trusting you. The king trusted Nehemiah. Why? Because Nehemiah had, had been a tremendous worker and had always been there to do the right thing. Fruitful, faithful, and he found favor. Faithfulness leads to favor with God too. So let's talk about that. Let me talk about men for a moment and then, then we'll take it to God. This is what I want young people especially to know. Leaders trust trustworthy workers. They trust people who've sacrificed, who are fruitful and are loyal. Those are the people who get promoted. Huh. Because they work hard. You say, are they brown nosers? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being a faithful, loyal worker. That God, God asks all of us to be that. It's in the Bible. And yes, leaders will entrust more into the hands of those that have been productive and faithful. Those who are faithful find more favor with their bosses. More favor comes from leaders because favor was shown by the worker. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 5, And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I might rebuild it. And the king essentially says, how can I help you? All of these things that are true about Nehemiah finding faithfulness because of where he'd been or, or, or finding provision because of his faithfulness, favor because of his faithfulness. Okay, here it is. It's true with God too. Yep, God loves us all. Just like you'd love your children. If one of them went to prison, you're gonna love that one as much as you love the other. But if one is faithful and productive and serves God and, and, and does wonderful things, you're gonna appreciate that about that one and you're gonna know that they're more responsible to put things into their hands because of their history. 
You love them the same, but you don't have the same entrusted to them in the same favor. Now, the good, here, here's the thing about faithfulness. You can't do it in days. You can do it a day at a time, but it's good. faithfulness has to do with time and duration over weeks, months, and years. It's the very nature of the word. Faithful over time. And when you show yourself to be that, Acts 6, there's one of the young men that were selected to wait on tables and be an usher there uh, was, was a person that eventually becomes an evangelist of great standing in the community. But he started by waiting tables, just being faithful in that setting. God entrusts trustworthy workers. Those who sacrifice, those who are fruitful and loyal to God get more of his favor. Man, that almost sounds like heresy, doesn't it? Well, look what the Bible says. Psalm 512, surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor as with the shield. Now, there's an imputed righteousness. We get the righteousness of Christ when we get saved immediately. But this is talking about those who walk in faithfulness, that righteousness. You bless the righteous, those who walk in a right way. Psalm 8411, for the Lord is a sun and a shield, and the Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from everyone? Nope. From those whose walk is blameless. Huh. So you want God to use you, be faithful. Be faithful in the little things. He'll make you faithful over much. Here it is in the New Testament, Matthew 6, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek his righteousness? That means... There it is again, that, 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 that talks about the integrity, the character, the faithfulness. And you know what? You can start to be faithful now and people will recognize it and they will walk with you and they will love you. But I'm gonna tell you, I've seen people who are so against God one day, they're, they're, they're Saul who became Paul, but their heart turns around and, they're, and in months they're digging and in and just a year they're, they're rising up, they're becoming closer to God. You know what I saw John Priest, one of our elders and a pastor here for 15 years? You know what I saw John do? I saw him grow in two years more than people who'd been in a church for 40 years. John was a high-level businessman. He, worked, he, he had leadership over 300 truckers uh, at, at Redaway Trucking. At one, he was a manager of, of all those employees, but he was an alcoholic. <clears throat> and uh, and, and, and he, he, I think he would tell you he wasn't a very good husband. Wasn't home, wasn't there for his kids, but he got saved. His life totally changed, man. And, and, and I'm telling you, he started digging with God that first year and he grew and he grew beyond other people because some people have 20 years, you say they have 20 years of growth, but it's really one year of growth for 20 years. Like they're just doing, they're not, they're not really digging to, to grow and go, okay. I'm, I'm getting off my sermon here again, but uh, when God finds workers who honor and appreciate him with their lives and actions, he honors those servants with his favor. Those who follow better get more favor. Yes, God will entrust more into the hands of the faithful and the obedient worker. It's all through the Bible. You can't deny it. Why did he choose David? Why did he choose Mary? Why did he choose Moses? He, he's looking for people whose hearts were towards him. More favor comes from God because more favor was shown by the worker. Now, when people talk about favor these days, it gets kind of messed up because they make it about money. Riches are the least of God's blessing. Let me say that again. And so what I'm talking about is provision to do his vision. That's the favor I'm talking about. Like he he, he, he gets you on the journey and then he brings it because you've been faithful. It's not all about self-enhancement. It's about his kingdom, right? Again, Luke 16, 10, a different version. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful over much. So I'll close with this story. Sorry, I've gone so long, man. I'm just full of, uh, I hope Jesus today, full of where he's taken us. In the last 10 years, this church has given $13 million to missions. $13 million to kingdom builders. And we've had some miracles happen among us that are, that are really unusual. For instance, in 30 years, we've had six donations of a million dollars. We've had two of 900,000. We've had about 10 over 400,000. Very unusual, very unusual. Why did that happen? Because I'm a good fundraiser? No, no. 
I tell our people, when God does a miracle here with this building, because I believe he's going to help us build it debt-free, he told me, you take care of my children here who can't build for themselves, and I'll build it for you there when you can't build for yourself. You can build there for hundreds of thousands. Here's it. It's tens of millions for the same building. So we've given to missions. We, we haven't raised money to build buildings. So here, I want to tell you a story that's recent. That one was years ago. We have a new project, $12 million building. Millions has already come in in ways that would surprise you. Some of it is the, is the government employment retention credit. We've received $1.6 million from the government because we didn't fire an employee. You say, you take the government's money. Hey, the devil's had it long enough. Give it back. Let's go. Give me that thing. Give me that. Give me that. I'm going to sow it into the kingdom. <clears throat> But then there's other ways that houses and people sold and some property we had that we, you know, we finally found a way to sell. And, but we have a few million. And then if we sell this property over here, it needs to take, change designations. We'll get, we'll get $7 million from it. And that would give us the $10 million or so to build this new building. And we believe the Lord's given us a miracle because we didn't raise it. We gave to missions. That's the miracle. It's a missions miracle. And, and so um, I'm pretty excited about that. And we take a couple of donors to a foreign field to give to a missionary project, some wealthy people. And while we're there, they gave substantially. I'm excited about it. We're building the kingdom beyond this place. And while I'm in Europe, I get a call from Randy Campbell. I call him our necessary evil because he always keeps us in budget. And it feels like he's stopping us, but he's helping us, Right. And he says, Pastor, the project's gone from 10 to 12 million. And I'm going to tell you, I was discouraged. I hung up that phone and I'm like, God, how's this work? You know, we're over here, we're giving substantially. I'm not going to tell you much, substantially to, to missions, the church and these donors. We're here doing this for others. And, and I, I, I told Randy, I called him back. I said, um, call the people together. We're going we're gonna to call off the building project. And the reason is we... I, I, I want to build it debt-free. I'm not sure I can. Now, we're not debt-free, but I want to build that building debt-free so we don't get any further in debt, right? I'm, I'm concerned about the next generation. How about that? I want it to go well for them. I want them to be fully equipped and on their way without problems. I want them to worry about people and not buildings. I've had to worry about buildings. I have a Nehemiah call, by the way, if you're wondering. I got to build it. He put it on my heart. So I got to rally people. We got to build it. It's not just that building. There's another, it's going to scare you to death. There's another $27 million building on the other side of it for the school. We're working with donors in a campaign right now to move towards that. And we're believing the Lord's going to give it to us. You see, that's crazy. I know. <laughs> How about making your vision so big you can't accomplish it unless God shows up? Wouldn't his vision be that big? This one is that big. Well, so we pulled the, Randy pulled them together. We had a meeting. I told our architect, all our people, there were several in the meeting, we're going to pull off the project. Why? Because we, we don't have it in hand. And they said, well, we could cut a million out. Okay, we got, we got a million. That's good, but we, we still got another million. And because people have sacrificed here before, and because that sacrifice cost us, you know, not only when we gave, but it cost the church because we pulled hard so we could be here on this land today. And when you pull hard, a lot of people don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to do that again. I don't want, I don't want to, I, I, I would like to see God bring it without us having to hit people hard for it. And so we're pulling off. And um, they said, well, we can cut a million. I said, good, we need another million. And, and someone in the room says, well, I guess this is the point. This is just like months ago. My wife had a dream. And we, we feel like we're supposed to give a million dollars. I'm like, okay. He said, would that change things? I go, potentially, yes, yes, that would change things. So we talked and we thought, okay, we may have it in hand. Now, I don't know, numbers keep changing and the, the journey, it's never one straight path, I'll tell you that. 30 years on this path, it, it's like this, you know, we're, but we're getting further up the mountain. And you say, why do you care about buildings? Well, listen, we can't, we can't even have a prayer meeting midweek because of all the basketball games and sports in this school. 
If we have a facility, this church will launch in a way that it never has. Where women's Bible studies, men's meetings can happen. That building will be predominantly church. And listen to me, I'm going to throw some vision out there. There can be Hispanic church service over here on a Sunday. Sunday, Maybe a Sunday afternoon in the new building. Can't do it now because we have youth here at night. But there's so many more things that we can do as we, as we go forward. And we're trusting the Lord's going to take us there. But what's it about? It's about that one getting saved. It's about people being discipled. That's what it's about. Nehemiah's request was granted. He's given the time and the resources. I want to bow your heads. We're going to pray. Father, thank you for this day. And I pray that um, vision would rise up in the hearts of people. Lord, help people to find their place on the wall here. To sign up and help us. But Lord, for those that are called to vision that you've given them beyond this place. Help us to help them. Lord, we are, we are not just a church that invites people to come. We are a sending church as well. And so would you help us with heads bowed and eyes closed? I just want you to ask the Lord about your place on the wall. Your place in the community. The places God would have you to step into for his sake and his glory. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask this question. Is there anyone here who doesn't know the Lord and you want to give your heart to Jesus today? You've been sitting, you've been watching, maybe even watching online, and you're saying, man, I believe those guys are sincerely on a journey where there's a God who's speaking to them. And that Jesus they're talking about, you felt the tug because the Holy Spirit is tugging your heart to give your heart to Jesus with heads bowed and eyes closed. If you want to come to Jesus, I want to help you do that. Lift your hand up on the count of three. If you lift it, no one looking around. We're all going to pray a prayer together. I'll lead you in a prayer line by line. You'll repeat it, a prayer to ask for forgiveness, a prayer to ask Jesus to take up residence in your heart. But you won't say it alone. We'll lend strength to your voice. We're not here to single you out or embarrass you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Are you ready to give your heart to Jesus? Are you ready to get on the journey with him? Are you ready for fulfillment that's beyond what you've ever known and the promise of the hope of heaven? Are you ready to receive him? He's been longing for this moment with you. He loves you so much. He's been pursuing you. He died on a cross and was raised by the Father to to prove that he's the way, the truth, and the life. He died because he took the punishment of your sin and mine so we wouldn't have to bear it. And so grace might be offered to us right now, to you right now. Grace, because Jesus gave his life and said, Father, I paid the price. You don't have to punish anyone. The punishment fell on Jesus, so it would not fall on us, on you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. You ready to receive him? No one looking around. Lift your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Just lift it high if that's you. Okay, God bless you, God bless you. Let's all stand to our feet. People are coming to Jesus. Would you pray with me now? Say these words. Say, Father God, please forgive me. I've sinned and I've made a lot of mistakes. Jesus, come into my heart and make me brand new. I'm going to follow you with my life. Thank you for saving me and for forgiving me. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen.